So you've probably seen or at least vaguely familiar with the film The Exorcist. It was a hugely popular movie in the 70s. It made like $400 million against a $12 million budget. It was all about some girl who was possessed by a demon and priests come to do spiritual battle against this demon and free the girl from her possession. It's all very exciting, but is it biblical? I mean, the Bible does talk about Jesus and driving out demons. Was it as intense as the movies? And do demons still possess people? If so, are we as Christians able to exercise them or drive them out? And what all is entailed with that? And what does the Bible have to say? Let's take a look. Attention, bargain shoppers. So I'm going to start by giving a little bit of biblical context, then we'll look at how the Bible describes demon possession, and then we'll talk about what that looks like today. So to begin, let's look at Matthew 12. This is an interesting section of scripture where Jesus is interacting with the religious leaders of the day. He's blatantly questioning their perceptions and the status quo. And so the people brought to him a demon-possessed man. Matthew 12:22 says, Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. So this tells us a couple of things. First, the demon possession affected the host physically. They couldn't talk or see. Second, the general public of the day was familiar with this and understood it to be demonic possession. And the religious leaders began to think, well, maybe this guy is from Satan, referring to Jesus. Maybe that's why the demons listened to him. And this is where Jesus famously said that a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. Right before throwing in in Matthew 12, 27, and if I drive out demons by Satan, by whom do your people drive them out? So this is a clever retort, but it also tells us that it was fairly common practice for the religious leaders of the day to drive out demons. This was a known and accepted practice at the time. So what does demon possession look like? Well, demons torment their hosts in some way. We just looked at one example where it caused the person it was possessing to be mute and blind, isolating them from the world around them, cutting them off from community, from relationships. Then we see in Mark 9, 17 through 18. Teacher, we brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So here again, we have not being able to speak, but with the added seizure-like symptoms. Then we see a different example in Mark 5, 5, which reads, This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons of his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So here again, we have isolation. He's socially isolated, living on the outskirts of society, his mind being tormented, he's cutting himself. And many of these demonic possessions look a lot like things you would be familiar with today, like severe mental illness or psychological disorders. And it might be easy to write off the idea of demon possession as a superstitious explanation for disorders that people didn't fully understand at the time. Except oftentimes demons would speak through their host. We look in Luke 4, 33 through 35, which reads, In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, it is a little unclear how much control a demon has over its host. Is it that they straight up take control of the human body? How much of the actual person is still left in there? There isn't really a hard, clear answer to this. But by the way scripture describes it, it seems to be more like demonic influence. The Greek word often used here is dynamizuna, and this basically means oppressed by demons demons, held captive. I'm thinking probably more similar to Eddie Brock and Venom's relationship. They're riding around with the person, sometimes exuding control, but mostly just tormenting them. Which brings up a hotly debated question. Can Christians be tormented by a demon? There are arguments for both sides of this question. On one hand, we have 1 John 4.4, 4, which reads, But you belong to God, my dear children. You've already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. So the spirit of God is stronger than the spirit of the devil. And this is why many of the demons Jesus encountered cried out in fear when they saw him. In Luke 8.31, we see, The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. So God absolutely 
absolutely has the more powerful spirit. But does that mean that Christians can't be tormented? I would say that there is biblical evidence to say that we invite demons in with sin. We can look at 1 Samuel 18, 9 through 11, which tells us, So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The very next day, a tormenting spirit overwhelmed Saul. He began to rave in his house like a madman. So Paul had the sin of jealousy and threw that and invited a demon in to torment him. But you could also make the argument that Pentecost hasn't happened yet. So Saul doesn't really have the Holy Spirit within him. But then we look at Galatians 5.17, which reads, The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. So the implication here is there is a battle inside you. And if you allow sin in your life, you could be opening the door to demonic possession. Or at least evil having an influence over your life. But back to exorcisms. So driving out demons or exorcisms are at the core of Jesus's ministry. Right up there with healing the blind or making the lame walk. Jesus came to free the oppressed, to free those who are being held down by darkness. He even quotes this in Isaiah chapter 6. He has sent me to confront the brokenhearted and to proclaim the captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. The day of God's anger against their enemies. Jesus came to free his people from spiritual oppression, from the devil, from sin, from demons. And we do know that demon possession continued to exist after Jesus. There's an example in Acts 16 and 18 where Paul exercises a demon. Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. So sometimes this is done with a lot of trouble. I mean, the disciples had some difficulty doing this. But other times it was a very simple thing. So much of the pomp and circumstance and showing the crosses and all that stuff in the movies. It's just there for show. Burning incense, elaborate rituals, ornamentation. And exorcism is really no different than any other miracle. It's not any harder for God to drive out a demon than it is to heal a broken leg or give sight to the blind. And oftentimes this is done with just a simple statement. As Paul said, in the name of Christ Jesus, I command you to come out of her and the demon left her. So why don't we see demon possessions today? And this question is a little bit misleading because they do happen today, but it's maybe something that we don't deal with on a regular basis in regular American culture. And I would imagine that a big reason for this is 1 Corinthians 2.14. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. If people aren't concerned about spiritual things, if they're not looking at the world through spiritual eyes, then they're not going to see the spiritual things that are there to see. We've become a very secular nation. In other cultures around the world where people are very in tune with the spiritual and they expect to see demons, in those places there are more accounts of spiritual possession. But a lot of times today we're so numb to spiritual things that we just don't see it. I personally know people who have prayed over demon-possessed people and seen them miraculously transform right there in front of them. We know this does still happen because Jesus tells us, right before he ascended into heaven, he said, this is how you're going to be able to identify believers. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe they will cast out demons in my name. So I'd be curious if you have any stories or experiences with demonic possession. If you do, feel free to leave them in the comments below. I'd love to read them. If you found this video interesting, please feel free to like and subscribe. I'll leave the verses used in the description below. My name is Adam. This is Bargain Bin Theology. And remember, you get what you pay for.